Welcome to another edition of Insider's Guide to Energy EV mini series. With me throughout the series is Jeff. Jeff, welcome back to the program. Um, what are we going to be talking about today, Jeff? This is really exciting, Chris. We are going to be talking about V2G, and we have with us a true industry insider. Claire Brodo Johnson is the Chief Operating Officer of Hervada Energy, a leader in bidirectional charging for EVs. But <clears throat> Claire is amazing not only for her current role, but an illustrious career in energy, including as a board member, advisor, investor, and executive going back to her co-founding of Sun Edison. And it's had roles in many different companies, including uh, public service at the Department of Energy, Hannon Armstrong, Next Step Living, the list goes on and on. So we're going to start with Claire talking about electric vehicles, but we have to go more into her background because she has such an amazing perspective to bring to this challenge. And orienting on EVs, this is a really exciting thing to be talking about because by some estimates in 2030, there's an expected one terawatt hour of battery capacity in electric vehicles on the road just in the US. That's somewhere between two and three orders of magnitude where we are today. And that number can be achieved with only 7% of vehicles on the road. So this is a tremendous, tremendous resource if we can figure out how to unlock it. And that's what I hope Claire can help us with today. Claire, wonderful to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff and Chris. So Claire, at the top here, there's so many acronyms, V to G, V to L, <laughs> v, v to X, V to, what, what are we talking about here? What's your preferred uh, acronym and definition of, of what that means? Sure. Too many acronyms. That's something the energy industry does a great job of is too many acronyms. In fact, when I was at the Department of Energy, I had to make a list of you know three pages long of all the acronyms that were going around because no one understood each other. Um, <laughs> so vehicle to grid is V to G. V to L is vehicle to load. V to B is vehicle to buildings. V to H is vehicle to home. V to X is vehicle to everything. Obviously, the market hasn't decided what it wants to do. The best SEO um, uh, links that uh, end up being V to G, which is vehicle to grid. But the overall concept is the idea that your electric vehicle is an underutilized asset. There's a battery in that electric vehicle that happens ha to have wheels and, and, and chairs in it, right? That moves you from place to place. So it's a completely underutilized asset and it can discharge to the grid. That's, the, that's what we at Fermata Energy are doing. It can also discharge to your home. So it can power your home if your uh, grid goes down. That's the V to H thing and the Ford 150 that people are talking about. So you know, there's different use cases, different applications. What we at Fermata Energy are focused on is V to G, vehicle to grid, and currently vehicle to buildings. So discharging the electricity from your vehicle, which is your battery on wheels, to the grid. Um, the reason I joined Fermata Energy, despite all of these acronyms all over the place, is I really feel like this industry and electric vehicles and specifically vehicle to grid is at the intersection of three things. So if you think of a Venn diagram, we're at the intersection of one, decentralizing and decarbonizing the grid, two, increasing electric demand, and three, growth of EVs. And I've got stats about all that and we can talk about all that. But the reason I joined Fermata Energy is, and I'm not a mobility person by background, is because I really feel like mobility has to be part of the climate change solution in, in the context of decentralizing and decarbonizing the grid, increasing electric demand and growth of EVs. Great. Where are we along this journey today? So we've been doing this EV mini series. We're already a number of episodes in for our audience. You, you've yeah. heard folks talk about grid and pieces like that. And this is a common question that I would ask because I think for early movers and early vehicle to grid type efforts that, that I've been a part of and spoken with uh, experts on, uh, it tends to be fleets, right? It, it tended to be that the biggest bang for the buck near term was, hey, if I'm, let's say, a Fortune 100, Fortune 1000, I'm doing a fleet conversion, I, I'm probably easier to tee up and get a big bang for the environment and for the energy companies to plan for that. 
Yep. Um, are you are you still talking today? You, you gave all the acronyms. Are we are we focused more on fleets or individual <laughs> users at this point? Well, different use cases. So we at Fermata Energy have been focusing on fleets to date. But if you look at what people really want, at least in the United States, they really want to be off grid if the grid goes down. Now that you're seeing all of these grid problems in California, in Texas, there were projections about grid problems in the Northeast, which didn't really happen because we had a mild winter. But you know, in terms of demand, there's certainly demand for fleets. There's demand for residential, not really vehicle to grid, but being off grid. So using your vehicle to power your house. And then the third case use case, which is really, really getting pushed by the federal government is vehicle to grid with electric buses. There's an extraordinary amount of money um, via the IRA right now at the California Energy Commission. Colorado has a big program. The EPA has a big program, all pushing vehicle to grid electric school buses. So a bunch of different use cases. Yeah. So Claire, talk to us about that financial opportunity because I'm, I'm out of date on these numbers. When I looked maybe eight years ago, it was on the order of um, $100 per vehicle per year serving ancillary services markets. Um, you, you've indicated that it could be much, much larger, larger than that, separate from the state incentives for the infrastructure for operating a vehicle in a grid responsive manner in the best markets in the U.S. What kind of numbers are we talking about in terms of potential revenue? Sure. So let's um, let's talk about the states that are most interested in trying to support this and and with the legislation that they have. So the six states that are most promising to us right now in the vehicle to grid space are those that have the highest demand response rates and highest demand charge management rates. And those right now happen to be Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Colorado, and California. And one of the best markets for us right now, frankly, happens to be Rhode Island with Rhode Island Energy with a $400 per kilowatt demand response rate. So think about a Nissan LEAF, which is the first vehicle to be bi-directional. And that vehicle with a 20 kilowatt charger and has a 60, 60 to 64 kilowatt hour battery with one charger, if you discharge to the grid every time Rhode Island Energy asks you to do so, you can make up to $8,000 one summer with a Nissan LEAF. It's a lot of money. Then, of course, there's other parts in the United States where there's no demand response or very, very low demand response rates. So it's really very variable. And you know, a lot of what we do at Fermata Energy, I spent yesterday in Maryland, where I live, in Annapolis, talking to legislators about the need for... Um, legislative changes so that, you know, demand response via the Empower Maryland program ends up becoming more valuable. Um, it really is, it's, it's unfortunately run by public utility commissions and by utilities, some of whom are very anxious to have new po- battery solutions and some of whom are really not. So are, are the consumers ready to, to let let the demand response pull power out of their battery, right? There's always range anxiety. You know, the batteries have gotten good now, so there's there's quite a bit of distance. Most of the states you talked about are pretty densely populated, and, and, and your commutes wouldn't be very long. You might be in traffic for a long time in Boston, but it, right. the distances aren't great, right? Um, but are the consumers ready to seek control? I mean, obviously, if there's a payday, people like a payday, but they also would be nervous about seeding control of their vehicle. Yeah, so... So that's an excellent question, and there are a variety of responses to that. I'm not Pollyanna-ish about thinking that everyone wants to be a do-gooder all the time. Our tagline is park it, plug it, profit. So if you're parking your car, why not make money while it's parked? And, you know, most people have their vehicle parked 95% of the time. And some of that time is going to be in peak hours where you're going to make a lot of money. But fundamentally, people like their own stuff. And they like their own vehicle and they want to drive their vehicle when they want to drive it. So, you know, frankly, Fermata Energy is full of data scientists and software engineers and um, use case. And when people want to use their car is one of the many variables that we use when we're optimizing when someone could make the most money by discharging to the grid. So if you tell us ahead of time from 1 to 4 p.m. every Tuesday, 
I need to use my vehicle. Of course, you're going to use your vehicle. I mean, the vehicle first and foremost, again, I'm not a Pollyannish. I, I think people are going to make money when it works for them, right? So you're going to use your vehicle whenever you're going to use your vehicle. We're trying to focus on those people who want to make money when they're not using the vehicle and the vehicle's parked anyway, which is 95% of the time for most people. Got it. And then I guess the, the, the other question I have is battery cycles of charge and discharge, right? Yep. So, you know, I, I think there's plenty of people that would see a payday, especially, you know, as long as the, the, the pricing is high enough to make it valuable. The, the question is, is there also a consumer fear that, hey, I only have so many charges and recharges in my battery and the life yep. expectancy? I mean, a, an EV battery lasts a very long time, or at least long time as a battery, long for driving the car. But once it gets a certain percentage down, there's recycling where it goes into other uses. Yep. Um, how do the owners, and what's the market feel of that? Yeah, no, it's that is an excellent question. And I would say that's one of the biggest challenges holding back the opportunity is vehicle warranty. So we at Fermata Energy were able to get Nissan to approve our charger and our platform so that we do not void the warranty. And there's been a ton of scientific research done about charge, discharge, charge, discharge, how that impacts battery warranties. The OEMs are concerned about it. I'm not going to sugarcoat that either. But I think what we're going to find is that the OEMs who are most progressive are going to figure out how many charges and how many discharges make sense over the course of a year that end up not impacting the battery. And that's, I mean, that's, that's an ongoing story, but we were the first company in the country to get a, a major OEM to say, we are not voiding their warranty. And it seems like, gosh, for that revenue opportunity, $8,000 a summer, if you could get that, you're paying for your leaf in, you know, three to four years. Correct. So worrying about voiding a warranty when you could pay for the entire car and buy it again in, in four years. Uh, again, I, I, obviously that's an ideal case in a it's an ideal very case. high price right. market, Right. but it fine. Even if it's a half or a third of that, you're still significantly, it's worth it. Basically there's, um, there's a financial case to be made there. Right. But I mean, again, we cannot, you know, this is, this is new territory for me personally, right? I've worked with utilities my entire career. Uh, but now we are a teeny tiny little startup between a ton of behemoth utilities and a ton of behemoth OEMs. And, you know, the OEMs have a lot of power in the electric vehicle space. They have been told by the market that people want to buy electric vehicles, but they're doing that a bit kicking and screaming, right? And so if they can use a warranty, a battery warranty to keep this from happening, they will do that. <laughs> And I heard a recent interview with um, Jim Farley at Ford, and he's pointing the finger at the utilities, right? Obviously, the there OEMs have some say in the matter, but um, he's making the, oh, it's difficult to negotiate a rate there. It's different everywhere. Uh, obviously, you highlighted that in the, in the different states, even the leaders, it's going to yeah. be a patchwork for some time. How has that impacted your uh, deployment and ramp rate? I, I mean, that is the key challenge is, well, the, the, the several key challenges have to do with vehicle warranty, interconnection, and utility DR baselines and programs, right? So yes, unfortunately, it is going to be a patchwork. But to me, that feels very much like solar in the early 2000s when we started Sun Edison, in the sense that each utility was scared of connecting solar to the grid. And are you going to mess up my grid by adding solar and what is this interconnect? I mean, it took months or years to get an interconnection agreement for a solar installation that was small on a, on a solar rooftop. This feels very much like solar in the early 2000s. We're at the, you know, we're at the very beginning part of this industry. I mean, to me, if, if the reason I joined this company is I feel very strongly that our intersection of decentralizing and decarbonizing grid, increasing electric demand and growth of EVs, this has to be a part of the solution. And the way that utilities think is that, is that currently they think that you, well, I can't speak for all of them, but as a general rule, they think, oh my God, electric vehicles are a pain in my butt. 
right? Because they're increasing electric demand and I don't have enough transmission capabilities. I don't have the TND. I don't have the infrastructure. This is going to cause so much trouble, right? And the Biden administration and tons of states are requiring more electric vehicles, right? You see um, the EVs on the road in the U.S. have gone from 2 million to 20 in 2022 to 8 million in 2025 to probably 26 million in 2030. But wow, wouldn't it be great if the utilities could work with us collaboratively and realize we can be a part of the solution with the battery storage on wheels, not part of the problem? Yeah, it absolutely seems like an opportunity. Can you just talk a little bit about the interconnection process sure. and why that's so difficult? We're going to be digging into this a little bit more in a future episode. So I'd really under, like to understand, it seems that as a grid responsive asset, the interconnection process should be easier, especially for the types of applications you're seeking. It's not. Um, <laughs> it's not easier. I mean, I think utilities are overwhelmed by applications and um, several utilities in the Northeast, I won't name any names, will say that for a 20 kilowatt charger interconnect, it might take anywhere from six to 18 months for them to just review our application for 20 kilowatts. So wow. um, discouraging to say the least. And these are utilities that we've worked with before. So it's not new. We've worked with dozens and dozens and dozens of utilities across the country, not just in the Northeast, all over the country. And, you know, you think, okay, the first one's going to be a pain in the butt because they don't understand it. We don't understand. We have to do a bunch of work, blah, 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 blah. But the fifth, the 10th, and they're still saying it's a six to 18 month long process. I'm sure that there are more applications than they have the capacity to review, but it's not a lot of kilowatts that we're talking about, right? And so sometimes we're, it depends on the utility and each utility is its own special snowflake. So, you know, they, they sometimes consider us small, um, small capacity, or sometimes they can put us in different buckets, but the process is just incredibly long. And I would, I, I think um, there will be much more news about that in the near future. Yeah. <laughs> Does that get easier if you're doing non-exporting applications like demand charge management, or you're not even getting to zero in your fleet or behind the mirror applications? Uh, depends on the utility. I'm not trying to be difficult, but a bit you, you you still need to interconnect, and even if you're behind the meter, they still need you to interconnect. So again, you would think that they would think, wow, this is a, this is a, a tool that can be super useful to us, but most utilities really haven't gotten there yet. Is it because they're not ready yet or is it because they're making a different bet you think, right? Is it? Well, I'm a, I'm a bit of a pessimist on this. They haven't figured out how to make money on it. Right. I mean, let's be honest. Utilities are, you know, it depends on if you're talking about a TNT utility or you're talking about a generating utility, but you know, utilities have been built around an incentive structure such that they build new power plants and they get to rate base those power plants, or they build a new substation or some sort of new infrastructure and they rate base it. They haven't figured out how to make money on chargers and on charger platforms and off of electric vehicles. And so once we solve that problem, which again is a utility by utility problem, they will be more interested. And of course, it really depends on, you know, Neepool is very constrained. So, they, and they don't want more wind and they don't want more solar and they don't have, you know, more anything. And so you're going to have to find new resources. But you would think that a utility, you know, you could, we've argued this to a number of utilities, like you've got a um, very constrained substation or a constrained interconnection site and let's put a couple cars there for the 100 hours a year that you really need more electricity there. That's so much cheaper than building new infrastructure. And they've been completely non-interested. So it's really, it's about incentive structures at the end of the day. And it's not about volume though. It's incentives. You, you think there's enough volume to make it worth, worth the individual utilities effort right now at this point, based on the numbers that you and Jeff have shared already? A hundred percent. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it seems like there should be a pitch here for effectively increasing the capacity factor of TAD infrastructure if you're charging in off-peak times, which is exactly, you're, you're not only saying charging in off-peak times, you're saying discharging in peak times. So this should help the utility in terms of infrastructure, but maybe exactly. when they do the interconnection request, they say, 
yes, but what if instead of helping it hurts and it actually EVs charge exactly at the time when we don't want them to, is there a, com is there a case to be made there that you can prevent that or you can't prevent consumer to behavior and they're going to charge when they want to charge, even if it happens to be at, at grid peaks. Right. I mean, to a utility's defense, their job is to make sure anytime we want to turn our light on, it turns on, right? That's their job. And their job is to make money by doing that. So of course they can, they have brought up every single possibility, which is again, their job about what might happen. But the punchline is like, Somewhere between $1.5 and $2.4 trillion needs to be invested in the grid. And we're going to have 600 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030. And so there's just no way to pay for all that infrastructure, right? And everybody's infrastructure is different, which is why they're all their own special snowflakes. So I would just, I think that a lot of it is education and a lot of it is sort of fear of utilities. We know our space better than you do. We can't use these, just use these electric vehicles as batteries on wheels. It's a lot of education. And then it's, I, I frankly think it's a lot of sort of really bad things happening to utilities in the next several years before they decide to use this as a benefit to them. So we, we talked about the problems. Okay, I want to just see if we can take a, a jump forward in time. And Claire, you mentioned Please, that- yeah having seen the trajectory from solar, this feels like solar 15 years ago in terms of uh, utility readiness for adoption. We talked about the problems, vehicle warranty, interconnection, DR baseline and, and patchwork of programs. Let's jump forward in time. Let's think about that 2030 date. What does the future look like in which we've magically solved some of these problems? So excellent question. And that's fun. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of work that has to happen between now and then, but electric vehicles will all be bi-directional, right? So they will all be able to charge from the grid and discharge to the grid. All chargers, wherever you go, will be bi-directional. Now, most people are really going to want to drive up to a charging station, charge real fast and go away. Right. So again, I, I'm not Pollyannish enough to think that this is the solve for everybody. But for those people, when their cars are parked, why not make money off the grid? Right. And at some point, the incentive structures will be so high that they're going to decide from 4 to 7 p.m. the 20 days of the summer, I'll park it because I don't really need it. Then I'll do my groceries at another time right? or whatever it is. You know, <laughs> right. So, I mean, use cases are really critical. So, Every charger will be bi-directional and every OEM will have bi-directional vehicles. And there will still be utilities that are, you know, futzing around trying to figure out how to make this work. But the most progressive utilities will be using this as an enormous tool, which is a 100% underutilized asset right now. But people buying an EV today... Um, you know, they're still relatively early movers, right? I mean, I think right. they, they buy them because they've got great performance. They buy them because they have a good conscience when they buy them, or they think that, you know, the internal combustion engine's going to you know, be gone in a certain number of years. They might as well just make the jump now. Depending or on what there's in. hardly any O&M costs. It's much easier to, yeah, yeah, yeah a I mean, lot of different reasons. We definitely have had folks on that went over the cost, total cost of ownership being better. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the calculation that you're talking about hasn't really been a reality yet for most, right? So I, I still think right. for, for many, you know, if you're behind the meter, yeah, you do some peak shaving and things like that today for a fleet or whatever. You, you certainly understand that because you've got the skills. But if I'm just the average consumer and I'm buying a car, I'm probably not there yet. Uh, I mean, I might like to be able to sell it back and things like that, but I don't know that most of the people are making their buy decision other than the corner cases on making revenue from their battery quite yet. So safe? again, I think I think that's true, but there are different use cases. So I, my guess, Chris, is you're talking about a regular residential consumer, and that's probably true. Yes, though more and more residential consumers still early adopters, but they want instead of having to buy a diesel generator, they would love their electric vehicle to be able to power their house in the event of a grid outage. Right. So that's going to happen more and more. And and Ford 150 did a beautiful job of trying to prove that business case. Right which is a very different use case than discharging to the grid. Yep. The, the use cases that we're focused on right now are fleets and it's all about money for fleets, right? Depends. Let's talk. There's so many different types of fleets, but you know, the fleets have a bunch of vehicles that are parked all the time. Why not make money when they're not being used and school buses, right? 
So yes, of course it's early, but it, across those different sectors, there's people that are going to be using this and they're going to yeah, be. Yeah, I mean that's where I see, right? I see it mostly for peak shaving at this point, right? That's kind of what what I what I see. So yeah, um, but yeah, that makes sense. That's consistent with where I've seen. Um, Jeff, where do you want to go? Yeah, Claire, I think this is really exciting. We're going deep in a few areas on on V to G challenges, opportunities. I guess, given your background and career trajectory, why is it B2G that's the focus currently? And how does your uh, past experience inform how you're approaching these problems? Yeah, so I do not have a background in mobility. I've been in the, the climate tech, energy tech space since the late 90s and worked on wind at Enron. And I was the first renewables originator at Constellation in Baltimore, which is where I live now and founded Sun Edison and solar. I've done a lot of energy efficiency and energy efficiency financing, a lot of solar, um, founded Sunrock distributed generation recently. Um, but uh, so mobility is new to me, but it's very much a part of the climate tech solution. And so, you know, while it's frustrating to work with utilities, they are the people that get us our power, right? And so I, I really do feel like, I, you know, I was very early to solar and, you know, there's, you know, we could, on a couple handfuls, we can think of the people who have been in, involved in solar and, and commercializing solar at scale for as long as I have. And, that, and, you know, we were early and people at first thought, wait a minute, with a power purchase agreement, you're going to put 3,000 holes in my roof. I'm not even going to even own the solar panels on that roof. And then I'm just going to buy electricity from my roof. That doesn't make any sense, right? So, I mean, the idea of a power purchase agreement is something all of us understand right now. But when we started Sun Edison in 2003, nobody understood it and it was a ridiculous concept, right? So the V to G right now feels very much to me like an early play. So, so to both of your points, it's early. And there's a lot of challenges, but that's what I like. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of things that need to be solved, right? And it, it's not going to be easy, but it's going to, but there, but electric vehicles are here to stay, right? There are state mandates, there are federal mandates, there, you know, and so, and, and, and frankly, they're a completely underutilized asset right now, right? A million percent completely underutilized. So someone's going to have to figure out how to solve that problem. Right. This this is the future. Right. You've got so much infrastructure that needs to be built and changed. You've got increasing electric demand. Right. So people say that like electricity demand is, is going to increase 70, 17 percent from 2021 to 2030, up to 39 percent from 2021 to 2035. I mean, there's we've got a huge problem. Right. And a very old rundown grid depending on where you are in the country, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, Catherine Blunt's uh, book, California Burning, is, is, is a great example of that. We've got a very aging infrastructure. So something's going to have to solve this problem, and electric vehicles are going to be the solution. How exactly it works out, you know, 10 years from now, or while we're laughing and, you know, on to our next thing that nobody's even thought of yet, it will have to be electric vehicles in some way, shape, or form. So that's why I'm here. And this is, this is what you do. Right, you come into an industry early when it when nobody else can see it and figure out how to transform it into something that's that's obvious. Yeah, that's the and idea. I, I really appreciate you. Know, you bring up Catherine Blunt. She's been a guest on the show, a friend oh, of the good. show. So we, we we love having her insight into what's happening um, in the industry. Um, you know, you, you talk about the grid in the infrastructure, perhaps in some regions being. Um, not ready for all this is and it's interesting because when i talk to utility players and they've had plenty on the show that say they'll get there just in time and, and those are in the northeast they're in the u.s and you know they're all over the place um and, and what what the feedback has been this is an evolution right that that all those vehicles don't come tomorrow they come over time and they're going to be right. building this as we go that's that's the, the 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 reality of a lot of planners i've talked to and i think even in this series when you listen to the first episode or two we have some feedback that that they'll get there then we've had other companies come on that have the concept of, you know, microgrids or putting large battery storage where you could charge your fleet or things like that to help out. Right. Um, to me, what you talk about comes down to the software managing. Since we are talking about fleets, it's generally predictable. Now, granted, if I'm like an Amazon or delivery fleet, my core competence is delivering my product for my company. It's, it's not selling power in and out. 
So the question is going to be, does the software allow me to manage and get the return on investment out of the utilization I need, right? That, that's what that's I see right. the problem statement to be. Um, am I missing something there of where we are then at this? No, I mean, Fermata Energy is a software company, right? So we're taking, we're using a bunch of data scientists and software engineers to put together um, duty cycle, which is a really important part of it, demand response rates, utility information, telemetry, all of those things to optimize for best use cases for an electric vehicle. So yeah, it's it's 100% software enabled. Yep. And are there enough internet of things or sensors along the way where you get is the current infrastructure giving you the data to be the best that you can be from all the tools you have? Or are there some pieces? Of- I mean, we can get down to two minute interval data. So there's no, I mean, there's, there's no lack of data, right? Again, to me, it goes back to incentive structures. It goes back to how people make money. Um, and, or it's carrot or stick. So incentive would be the carrot or you do like California or something say, Hey, trucks are going to be electric or we're going to mandate these things. Right. Right, so but are, even are the we seeing that, that side as well, for sure. But I think there's a lot of uncertainty, and I think it depends on the state and how much power the Public Service Commission or the Public Utility Commission, whatever it's called, has, and how much they understand. Right. So, you know, um, and and so as an example, in Power Maryland, I was looking at my utility bill versus my colleague's utility bill. We get charged three times more in Maryland for our Empower Maryland bill than utility payers pay in Massachusetts for Mass Safe. And Maryland's still just doing smart thermostats. Okay, why is that? Because the Public Service Commission isn't ready for all this and because our grid is not nearly as constrained as Neepool's grid is, right? So the utilities aren't engaged and don't really need this the way that me so it's it's all incentive structure when it goes back to it and it's going to take a lot of people's policy time regulatory affairs time and again as i said i think it's going to take some really huge catastrophes before you know and mm-hmm. and utility bankruptcies before utilities do this coming in and 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 being being open to it anything new for utility is really hard because their job is to make sure the lights are on Anytime you turn that light on, I've, I've spent years working in utilities and that's, it's a hard, new things are scary, right? Especially when you're regulated to do something as complicated as, as making sure my heat turns on whenever I want it. Yeah. Claire, I'm thinking of a different question, which is how we make sure that this transition to renewable and distributed energy is an equitable transition. And Great particularly question. around EVs, there's a lot of challenges where how, how do we, keep this just from being toys for rich people? Such a good question. Such a good, well, so a number of things. So yes, it is mostly toys for rich people right now. And the tax, you know, tax benefits, 7,500 bucks per, you you know, all of that is incredibly inequitable, but electric vehicles are becoming cheaper, right? So I have a Prius Prime, which cost me $19,000, which is only a hybrid vehicle, but it's becoming more cost-effective. And there's going to be lots of regulatory fixes, right? So, I mean, you know, the federal government has the J40 um, and is massively subsidizing, providing, um, providing all of this infrastructure and all of these tools for lower income communities. We're working with um, enterprise enterprise community partners in the mid-Atlantic to try to create charging hubs. So, you know, they know the credit scores of all the people who live in their housing projects. And, you know, we can provide charging hubs for all of those Lyft and Uber drivers who live in those locations and they can charge their vehicle at night and discharge their vehicle and make money off of it during the day. Um, There's a lot of people working on these solutions right now, but yes, it's a critical part. And Jeff, we could have a much longer conversation about this, but there's, there's so much that needs to happen. In the past, I think we had a movie view on the program as well. Oh, fun. With them. And so yeah. once again, they're helping get fleets and helping get the cost percentage so that you understand the cost of driving an EV so that the social economics don't hurt people. I mean, that, that was one of the points when we talked to David over there and he went through all that modeling. So I think there, there are pockets of really interesting things happening, right? Right. Um, what, what I'm fearful of in those listening to this series is – it's so early that the industry hasn't consolidated and get into a unified approach, right? So 
Whereas you come out and say, hey, we got this great fleet strategy and there's you know 50 other entrepreneurs out there that also see great fleet strategies. We haven't acquiesced around a single strategy yet. And there's no one in energy, right? I think energy transition is, there's never a single silver bullet. But right. for standards and common commonality, it seems we're gonna need to kind of come to some common ground for a lot of these things in terms of software, in terms of interoperability, in terms of you know connecting up to the grid. That seems to still be far away from where I sit. I think that's right. I mean, there's still people arguing about Chatham versus CCS, right? It's clear to me it's the beta versus, you know, VHS argument. Chatham technically might be a better tool, but everyone's moving to CCS. So, you know, and Tesla's not playing nice in the sandbox at all, right? If you have a te- you have a Tesla Powerwall, you want to you know, so yes, there's a, there's a lot of consolidation that needs to happen, but it will, right? Just like it did in solar, it's going to have to happen because there's mandates that are being required. Yeah. And then just kind of before we kind of try to bring this all together, you know, dealing with corporates, are, are there new job titles or people that you're dealing with in, in the large enterprises that are managing the fleet? Or is this just the operations guy still that's inheriting this? Or are there folks coming out of school, like moving into jobs to help a large company manage their fleets. In yeah, electric. no, that's a great We've question. Had management for a long time, but yeah, so it depends on who you're talking about. But um, there are ESG roles everywhere, right? Um, and there's people who are sort of fleet managers, right? And driving the electrification of transportation. There's fleet electrification people. There's sustainability people now um, that those titles didn't exist five years ago, right? So for sure, corporates everywhere, particularly if they're involved in fleets in any way, are all talking to us at this point, which is great, right? Or the charge points of the world or EVGOs of the world, they understand that this is the future and all of them have different customer bases and they're all trying to listen to their customers and make sure the customers have a great customer experience, right? That's their jobs. So the customer experience is really critical. That's fantastic. Claire, we've covered a tremendous amount of ground in this conversation. So as we wrap up here, I'm yeah. thinking about some of our younger listeners, folks that yeah. are in, in school, grad school, or looking to move in their careers. Given your trajectory and having seen so many industry transformations and more ongoing, what advice do you have to some of those folks who are uh, in earlier stages of their careers? Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I've spent a huge part of my career trying to support other particularly young women, um, because I used to be the only woman in the room and it's exhausting. Um, and, and it's, it's really hard. So it's a delight to see the next generation, um, have more, uh, diversity. So I, a couple of suggestions is build and gather and refine the tools in your toolbox. So you can manage through any situation when it rises, everyone needs to have a ton of financing skills. He or she who manages the books manages the company. So it's incumbent upon everyone that's involved in this space to really understand financial models. Um, I think developing and nurturing a network of professional and personal friends whom you respect to give you honest feedback is really quick, really important. I think setting boundaries and sticking to them is really important. You know, whatever you're willing to put up with is exactly what you'll have. Um, I think fostering an equal playing field is really important, you know, creating an atmosphere of trust and connections through encouragement. It's, you know, I've, I've spent my entire career with those things in mind. Um, I sometimes get into trouble because I'm a super honest person and I'm super willing to support other people. And I spend a lot of time supporting younger people because I think that is the future of climate tech is we build this community. Um, and sometimes investors and other entrepreneurs think that's not a good use of time. And I just a million percent disagree and I will continue to do that. So I, you know, I want to support everyone as they're trying to build up their, their communities and their careers and their solutions to all of these climate change problems that we have. So, I, I mean, I really think, you know, defining and refining the tools in your tools box, putting together your network and setting boundaries is really, really important. Wow. Oh, cool. Well, we True words of show. wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we 
It's 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 been um, great pulling together. I really like the, the the bringing in the younger folks. We do that quite a bit on the podcast. We're always interested in the next generation because uh, you know they're they're the ones going to inherit all this and they're going to take over with Absolutely. it. And frankly, if I were in university today, I can't help but be bullish on the energy industry for the next 20, 30 years. It would be an amazing career, and they're going to see some amazing things change amazing. over the career. Yeah. Um, so I, I have to agree with that. It's been a pleasure having you our guest today. Thank you so of much. Of course. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I wish you both tons of luck as we try to solve these problems together. Claire, thank you for being a guest on the podcast today. Jeff, thanks for co-hosting with me. Uh, it's been an informative episode. I look forward to finding bidirectional charging being mainstream as soon as possible. Uh, it'll be interesting when this works across the entire United States or globally. Uh, for those that have just tuned in this first episode, if you're interested in EVs, this EV mini series has all kinds of content, everything ranging from grid to storage to battery tech to OEMs, you name it, we've got content on it. So please subscribe to the series, share it with your friends, find us on Facebook, find us on YouTube, and we will see you again next time. Bye-bye.